I just want to know how many people here are software developers or people who are comfortable with programming, developing web to applications. Okay. Yes, Five people so far. Okay, how many of you have used React before? You can lower your hand and three, almost four people. Right. Uh, what about Python? And how many of you here are uh, good with UI UX design or designing your interfaces before you start coding? Okay. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear you. Uh, you didn't hear the last part? Uh, yes, yes, the last part. Yeah, I was asking how many of you were uh, have done UI UX design or designing your user interfaces before using any coding framework. The first step before start uh, coding your front end application is designing the interface you are building. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, in reality, there some people have familiarity with this stuff. So, this tutorial will be much easier for you, but most of you, it's like uh, you don't have much interaction with building web applications or anything uh, in this area. So let's just go ahead and start with the tutorial. It's okay, but then a lot of uh, people joining this training come from different areas. Their background, all of them are not computer science or software development. Uh, but they can catch up. You can catch up with something that you can learn. Not that hard. It just needs your focus. So don't be discouraged. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, would you give me confirmation that you're seeing the screen? Thank you. Okay, you can see it bright, it's just I'm on another account of my screen. So what we're going to learn on this tutorial too would be how you can do user interface design with Figma tool. Uh, we're going to see how you can build, uh, we're going to see the overall architecture of React framework. Uh, we're going to see how to use Tailwind CSS. It is another tool. It's part of CSS. You say the CSS style sheet, but it is another form of using CSS. It is much uh, easier to use and we're going to use how you can build a backend REST APIs using Python programming language and finally we're going to see how we can integrate those two so they can read data between each other and finally uh, while also doing the backend we're also going to connect with our database uh, postgres SQL in this case so we're going to see these points uh, from the, from scratch so uh, by the end of this tutorial, you're going to have a full understanding of how a full stack application or programming works. We're going to see also a demo which touches all this area. So let's start from designing the user interface. So there are a lot of uh, tools to design your user interface. 
most commonly Figma and Adobe XD are used, and but there are tons out there, so you can go ahead and explore. Uh, but for this tutorial, we're gonna focus on Figma. Figma doesn't need an installation. It is a website on the internet. XD does need an installation. You can use it if you prefer. Uh, there are, these are just another tools that can help you build user interface. What it means by building user interface uh, is first, it's just when you have this application, for example, this, uh, the PowerPoint is start, it is an application, right, that you are using to create slides. So, but this is, this is an application where someone decided to put this files edit view tools menus right here. And when someone creates some slides, they decided to each page of the slide to be displayed here, and these buttons to be here. Someone who debuted this, uh, this docs, just this, this drives an object. Like, this is an application that's found in our in our account on, on the drive. You can find this application, right? So some designer out there who built this application have decided I want to put this and this, this is a design, this is a user interface itself. So this is the first step when you build your front end application, your first design, what you should put on that particular uh, application or particular front end application. So this is where you first put you, your creative, you push your creative mind and you just decide where should go where based on the project. This is what we call building design your user interface. And these tools helps you to put your imagination of what your application should look like on some software so you can visualize it before you start coding it. This is the purpose of designing your user interface. So now let's just go to Figma since we are using Figma to build some user interface. So Figma is the leading collaborative design tool for building for products right now. Uh, it's free for everyone. Uh, it is collaborative, which means you can add a lot of teams on your design so they can contribute on your design. Uh, it can help you to just create a team of developers to design one particular design, which just gives you like uh, GitHub is also you can collaborate in our organization. It's the same logic here. A lot of people can collaborate and do changes on the user interface. Uh, based on your invitation to them. So that is, it works in any computer since it's found in on the internet. Just by clicking figma.com, you can sign up and start designing your user interface. So it can work in any computer. It creates desktop, mobile application, tablet designs, anything you want. So just go to figma.com and sign up. So that's the only thing I have to do. So let's just sort of see how we can build uh, this just are shortcuts when you design one to zoom in to zoom out, just common shortcuts that you likely to use. So I also put references on how you can build uh, to understand the Figma software. There are tutorials you can watch on those. Uh, now let's just go here. This is when you sign up, this is the dashboard that you're gonna get. So I'm gonna show you how you can use it to your advantage. This is a dashboard user interface that I built, and I'm going to show you how I build it. So the first thing that you will do, let's consider this is empty. The first thing that you do, you have to pick a frame. For what purpose are you building? Is it, is it for desktop, for target, for mobile application? To choose that, this icon, this uh, some kind of, I don't know, ladder look like frame, it will help you to choose a frame. So just click the frame part and it will give you these options. So if I put iPhone box, it will give me an iPhone size board, so I can just uh, play with, with it for my design. But for this purpose, since we are planning to do a desktop application, uh, we're gonna choose a desktop framework. Yes, this okay. there are a lot of for phones, there are different versions of phone for tablets, for desktop, so since our choose is desktop, let's just choose desktop here. So we get this frame to build our application. So I, like I told you, I already built this user interface. Let me show you how I did it. So for the first thing that I did is choose the background of my frame. This is the desktop. So uh, I could choose anything you want here. You could choose any color. 
but just to pick the color that I already chose here, all you have to do is click here. When you click here, I will get the color of this design. So this is the color that I want, just to make it similar. Okay, we just have to this. Now I am getting similar. The other thing is I decide to put my menu here. Uh, let me just zoom out a bit. This is your creativity. It, it, someone can decide to make the menu here on the nav bar or on this side. It's just your creativity. Uh, there's many guidelines for which content you should put on your framework. So here, if you can see the design here, I put a rectangle, a, a narrow rectangle, right? So here also, this is a rectangle. This one is a rectangle. The background is a rectangle. And above that rectangle, there are other contents added. So how you can choose a shape for your design would be this icon on the above. So there are shapes. Tools. You have this rectangle, at least polygon, any kind of shape you want. So since I want rectangle, I'm going to choose rectangle. And just pick something here. Uh, use your mouse or your laptop the touching area and just click and then drop like this and just decide how to do this and let's say this is the width of the menu for example i want so if i want to make a similar with this one i also again can find this width here there's the data of that one here uh, but it's okay, it doesn't matter if an it's, it's, I give it, if you want to give it a radius to make it, uh, give it some kind of edge here to be rounded, you can use that. And uh, let's just again pick the color from this one. This is the color that I use, so I can make it as well. So this is, uh, we don't have to go through every design here, but uh, you can pick the color and put it. Now, what it, I'm going to just show you the most important things here, uh, how you can add a chart on your design, how can you use these signs, these icons, how you can use them. The rest is simple. Again, for this one, you can add another rectangle. For this one, another rectangle. So let me just add one rectangle here, and I'm going to show you the rest one. Let's add this rectangle. The color is similar to this one. And the other thing is, if you see this one, the sharp, the edges are sharp, but this one is a bit rounded. So we have to make it rounded. Either we can use the value from here. This one, if you can see, this is mixed. And the uh, x and y values are a lot of numbers. So let's just uh, you can hold this one and just increase. If you can see, if it, I don't know if it's easier for you guys, but I just rounded the edges. So this, when you practice it, you will get used to how you can manage this part. So now I'm just going to show you the most important parts. Uh, this part is for adding pages. So I'm, I'm just going to, I can just click here and write something. It says top. So anyway, this text just gives you another uh, 
trace to a text in any value you want, so you can use this function for your purpose. So for adding icons like this one, this part, this plugin resources. Here you can just click on the plugins part, and you can just add items. I want to add items. So there's a lot of plugins for adding icons. So let's just use the first one. Just click run. Now it will give you a lot of icons here. So you can pick your pick. Let's say you want this one. Just click. You just added it here. So if you click this one, it will give you all of its contents here, which you can add, change the image. Uh, you can add, change the icon color or increase the size, whatever you want. You can again do the same thing here as well. So yeah, you can drag it and you can put it here wherever you want the icons. Uh, the other thing is for the chart. How you, let's just grab this one. And again, let's say drag it and just write chart. On this one, there are a lot of chart like options. I just choose the first one. There is a line chart, a scatter chart, an area chart, a bar chart, a pie chart. You choose your pick, let's say you want to choose the area chart. You can minimize the number of series here. You just ask one, the data points have 10 data points right now. You can minimize it or increase it. Uh, you can also style the color. Hide this. So once you uh, edit it here, you just say add chart. And you will add it on your board. So uh, let's minimize. You just put it in here so you have to grab it. Choose everything and put it to the place that you want to put. Again, here I want to display it. So we get the point, right? So I just decided on this particular uh, part of my user interface, I want to add this chart. This is a design. I'm designing like you know, it's just I have a paper and pen. I'm designing. I want to have the menu here. I want to add the chart here. I want to do this here. I want to put this content here. You can design using this tool or the Adobe XD, however you want. And once you do have a clear vision of what your app will look like, now you go to your React app or Streambit and start coding to make this particular design to life with your coding. So that is the first step that you, a full stack developer, will do it. Start from the design when you bring a front end and it goes to the front end. And all you have to, once you design the color of your application, the font of your application, which you can decide here, you can decide the font type also. So once you decide all this part here on the front, but you don't have to think, you just have to uh, get the information that you already put here and implement it on your coding. So, this is what a UX designer usually do. Uh, this is the first step of building your funded application. So this is what you're designing your uh, user interface would look like using Figma. And the other shortcut here that I mentioned would be that I didn't use so far would be Control G, which is a useful key also. So now let's say I want to drag this one. You see? It's just removing the background only without including this one. So to avoid this kind of error, you have to just, once you're done with the design, just control G. It will group everything. Now, if I can group it, let me just again select everything. And if you click control G from your keyboard, it has groups. And now you can move them around together or component and if you decided to ungroup it so you can edit each component uh, once you group it you cannot edit each component so to edit that all you have to do is again click this or by right clicking you can ungroup it 
in the process. These are just come up, the shortcut will come up when you practice building user interface with Figma. So I hope that's clear. Now let's just move to, front, to the front end part. If you have any question, you can raise your hand on the user interface. Now let's go to React Framework. Uh, there's a lot of framework frameworks out there, but we're going to focus here on React Framework. Um, React Framework is declarative, efficient, uh, flexible JavaScript library for building user interfaces. We use React.js because it has a potential to reuse component, which means one component you, you, you created on React, you can reuse it for different purposes just by calling that component's name. So it has a potential to do that. And uh, it helps you to build rich user interfaces. With React, you have the options to download a lot of libraries that are compatible with the React framework that you can use for different purposes. So it's rich with a lot of packages. React is rich with that resources. And it's easy to learn. So uh, for, for uh, frameworks, uh, for friendly frameworks, mostly JavaScript and TypeScript are commonly used, especially JavaScript. So if you have along the way, try also to improve your JavaScript skill because it's really an important language for printing application. So to see the React documentation, you can go ahead and click this one, which also can guide you how you can install React on your application. The command is simple if you go to the installation part. This one. This is the command to create your first app app on the application. Just run it and it will go, uh, it will ask you some questions, answer those, and it will. Uh, create the application. But this one, I usually don't prefer using it because it takes two, three minutes to install the React application. But there are other ways of uh, downloading or installing React on your application. So one of the so one of the applications out there, or one of the mechanisms, there's a framework named White right.com so if you go there you can upload the I mean, install react through their framework which takes only seconds to upload to install react on your application so we can use uh, their framework to download react but this both have the same feature the same thing there's no any difference it's just the way you install it by the pure react according to the documentation it's just there's a time difference we need to the package, so I usually prefer this one. So we can uh, use this one and install the React application. So now let's go to the data application here. Just get this one. Project name will ask you to get a name, so let's just paste this. Their framework has a lot of frameworks. It can you can uh, using wide framework. You can uh, install the view framework, the React, the pre-React. These are a lot of frameworks like React that build uh, applications. So since we want React, we're gonna just use a uh, pen on your keyboard and click React. I can download React using the TypeScript language, or I can use the JavaScript. Let's speak to the JavaScript one. That's it. Once you finish the application, the answers, it will finish. And if you use the guidelines, how you can run it, you do that. With the formal, it just it, it wouldn't be as fast as it. It just will take one or two minutes. So whatever your preferences, you can go ahead and explore with both. The same output you get at the end, either way. Okay, before we go to Tailwind, let's see. Okay, let's just, go, let's just go with this one first. Okay, Tailwind CSS. Before, if you are, if any of you here are not familiar with CSS, the pure CSS language, 
before jumping into Tailwind, stick with the CSS language. But for those of you who are comfortable with CSS, you can go ahead and explore Tailwind CSS. Tailwind CSS is an additional framework that's built above CSS. It uses the same logic as the CSS language, but it makes it much easier how you write it. It, it gives you the option to write inside your application. Let me just show you, uh, for example, if you see it, it says index CSS, right? So the few, you know, this one, let me, let me just show you this one. When I see the pure CSS, the pure CSS look like this. You call a names from your application and you give them these styling, uh, styling fun functionalities here. So uh, the purpose of CSS is to style your user interface. So if I decide to put this menu right here, I have to use a CSS language to, to, to tell it, to put it on the top. That is the purpose of CSS. So we're not gonna cover CSS. So, but I have put a beginner guide how you can understand this code. Uh, how can you understand CSS language on that present slide? So please check that to be familiar with this kind of language. It's really important when you want to beautify structure your user interface to the right places. So a normal CSS, you have to create a CSS file and write your CSS and your component will understand it and will give your user interface some kind of structure based on it what you wrote. What different Tailwind CSS is, Tailwind CSS, instead of creating a different section by saying Apple CSS or any other CSS file, let's say this is my component here. Yeah, this one. Under my page, I have a lot of pages here. For example, let's see this one. I already have installed Tailwind TSA, so you see it here, right? I just put this R Tailwind. It will help, it will give you the option to write your CSS latest to your component. In, for, if I want to use this normal CSS, I have to import by saying import, import up. Says I have to import this file to my component for any changes, any component CSS file written to be understood by this component. I have to import the uh, CSS file when you use a pure CSS file sheet. But when you use Tailwind, you don't have to do any import. You can directly put your CSS next to the component. So if I want the heading to have a size of 3XL, I'm just, I can give it next to the component like this. If I want to have a margin button, uh, bottom uh, space between the user list, which means this one will give after the user click heading, there will be a 10 pixel gap before it's uh, put the button. So between the button and the heading, there is a button and there is a gap of 10 pixels. This is what I did. So the thing with CSS will just give you the option to write your CSS next to the component that you want to Beautify, right? With normal, so you have to import the change. Then the component will understand it. I hope that's clear. But other than that, the logic is the same. This, this CSS is also found. This is all of them are the CSS direction. So you have to understand CSS to do things with it. They are not different than the same. The language is the same. It's just the way you write. Okay, so why you say Tailwind CSS? It's finding in to build processes because you will uh, do it next to your component it's faster. Uh, like I said, it's a 21st class CSS format, which means we can use a class to build custom designs without writing CSS as a traditional approach. That one is the traditional approach. It's just there are a lot of not Tailwind, there are also others, less, uh, there are other also so like Tailwind that can just make your experience much easier. The traditional way is the one that I just showed you. By naming a file, the CSS, you can create your CSS and import it to your component. 
So uh, how you can install a table into your application, all you have to do is this one. You can run this command. So let's go to the application we just created before. And just this one. Okay. Once it's time, when that's finished, let's just go with the application. So I have put uh, the slide, I have put for the React references. That can give you started in understanding the framework for table, the same thing. The table, they have their own documentation as well, where you can find uh, the comments. To you. So, if I, again, this is also can show you here how you can first install things into your act up. Uh, you can follow this one as well. On the way you well, but we'll just see it here uh, by the installation, but it's also another guidance how you can install Tailwind or integrate Tailwind with, with your React app. You can try this one. Also, let's say I want to uh, take color. So if I want to add a color, what is the tailwind code? If you want to know what is the tailwind code for adding different colors, it will give you this graph. So, in, uh, along to the, your component tab, the tab name, if you add text gray 200, it will give your text a gray color. Uh, you you can add the color darkness by adding the number here like this. So, the documentation is really easy to understand. It will guide you what you have to do. If I want the pink color, I just have to copy this one and put it next to uh, the HTML tagline in my component, and I will get each color, uh, the color that I choose. So, here it is. It's also give you an example. So, if you have a paragraph, just on React application, class name is not only class, you have to write class name, then Put it like this and add the text to purple 600 in the paragraph will have a color of purple. It's simple. The documentation is simple to understand. Just any question that you have ask it and you put you the possible react cases that you can use for the particular purpose. There's a lot of or fun family again. You have the option of this is a fun family size. This is just and is there documentation to understand? So go over through it to understand the image. Also. So let's just first see. Okay, I'm installing. Now we're going to initialize the yeah, table set list. When you initialize it, new files can be added to your React app. Here, we config.js and post config.js this file is added. Now you have to If we go back to the installation part, you can see here, you can correct on the two we copy the uh, it should be like this, so you can copy it and paste it on your terminal config. Just for the installation, and it can be closed, or you can leave it at this one also. It's okay. Uh, the one thing that we have to do for terminal to be understood by this React app procedure, is where it was it this one this one under your src file on the react there is index.css on that one you have to add this one so you have to copy it and go to src then index.css the installation itself will give you guidance so about this one this one or this one 
and remove all the CSS when you are creating CSS, you can replace it with this. Now let's just run it or and see the change. This is tiny, it's come by this one. I haven't I still used the CSS file. Uh, it's just understanding this. The dark color you see by ground color dark. It's, it's giving this uh, traditional CSS, it's giving this tiny. Now let's, by using Kelvin CSS, let's just uh, change the color of this heading. So if we are in, if you install it correctly, it should work. So now let's find the project is the white class react heading, this one. All you have to do is just say class name and say paper. Um, can see the green, all the commands will find here. So you see, I have this shortcut, right? The ones that you see in the documentation. How I get this shortcut in my basic code is because I installed an extension here. On your extension, you can write a link. So I installed this in particular extension. That's why my basic code is detecting when I write a return in code and it automatically will grab me the different option that I have. So install that extension if you decide to use a link, uh, it will make your job much easier. Okay, now let's see if the uh, let's refresh it. Let's just try it again and see if we can see the change. Because there must be some our installation is not correct. Let's go through it again. So I have a documentation for to do the config this one. Okay, now let's just read. I think the way I have copied everything it should work now. Let's just restart it.
Let's just try this one with uh, some buttons on left. Let me start. I think Scotia is my JS version. So it doesn't matter since I already have already built a connected React application. It doesn't matter. So anyway, the step is similar uh, in my work with your node version. I think mine is Scotia is the package. Just run this one. This is some applications that are already been integrated with Stellar. Let's just run this one. Okay, I can show you this. You don't need to take the next one. Let's just add this screen. Let's see what's between the color. So uh, I'll check the if you if the deal win installation give you a problem, please uh, share it on the slide. We can fix it. I I don't know what that one is for that era, but it should be able to build on the documentation. So since I already have this connected Tailwind application, uh, we're going to see the demo to this one just to save time. And let me just finish the slide. Right. OK, for the Python backend, uh, by now, you already all of you already installed Python on your computer. You already have an RGS, so you got to go with your building your REST API with Python. For building by Python with Python, there's a lot of frameworks that you can use. One of them is Flask. The other would be Django. And there's a fast API. These are just frameworks that you can use to build REST APIs. They all use a Python language. There could be other sorts, of, but these are the most famous ones. For this demo, we're going to use Flask. Uh, so the installation of Flask is again simple. All you have to do uh, is pip in, pip install Flask. You can install Flask on your application, but these are additional packages to install also. This one. There is no any invite. This is a typing error. Just pip install. Uh, you can just forget this one. I'll edit the slide. Anyway. Uh, this uh, Flask is fail alchemy will add the package for you to connect with your uh, database. Uh, Flask course, it will just help you prevent course errors. So when your application is running on the internet, it might uh, get some course errors uh, saying I can uh, detect this uh, particular route or REST API route. So to avoid those errors, you should install this course error and once the installation is successful just run class run and you will have a running bucket application so we're gonna see how you can do that references also here for plus for Django as well you decide to use Django and again like I said they all use Python the only difference is their framework you have to understand how their framework work so it's just uh, like so now let's just go back to the demo and let me just show you quick what the demo looks like first. So this is the front-end framework that's built using React and Tailwind. And in this one, I put the Flask uh, folder here, but you can also remove out, uh, differentiate your front-end and back-end by backing in Safari folder and front-end in Safari folder. But I don't want that. I want to put both of them in the same folder. That's why I put it on the React folder. I mean, 
folder. So this is my backend anyway. Go to install again. Let's just go back to the Flask folder here. Uh, like before, I created a separate environment, Python environment, which is not a requirement, but it's a good practice. So if I run Flask run, it will run since I already installed most of the package that is listed on the slide. Just say pip install and add everything. So there are also a case that I didn't write on the slide, like this one. Uh, Flask Marshmallow, it is another Flask uh, Python uh, library in my package that can give you a smooth uh, experience when you build REST APIs on the backend. Last course, I already showed you that. Uh, this time, this is a default, you don't have to install it. And Flask is me. this is it. So, only thing that I didn't mention on the slide is uh, Flask Marshmallow. Again, it's not a requirement. You can you can build a REST API without this library, and this library just gives you uh, a seamless interaction with building REST API. It can provide serialization and serialization, which means you can return your responses. The REST API responses could be transferred to a JSON format. So, just the how the response should be. Outputted or resulted on your framework or any on your application or something like that, it can help you to make it in JSON format. So it's just a preference, but not a requirement. You can again build a, a REST API without this framework. Uh, this one I would recommend, it's very useful. It will uh, remove a lot of errors that can happen when you call a REST API in the proper front end. So this will avoid that. It's a good argument. We need that to put it in our database. So let's just start from the back end. What, what did I need to do to build a REST API? So the application basically uh, add users to your database. And we can, we, we're we going to see a CRUD application where we can create a user. And that user will be stored on our database. And we can retrieve those users. We can edit those users. And we can delete it. So I'm just going to show you this simple application uh, just to show you the connection between the front end and the back end so here i'm just by using class i'm just identifying uh, a table in my application in my database so the, I have, let's say i have the table name users and i'm defining the users table have an id a name and an email a date and i'm also defining each field it, the id is a primary key uh, I'm giving the name is a string, the email is a string, the date is date time format. So I'm just giving it uh, indicate uh, declaration or uh, explanation for each field here. So this is just a model representation for my particular application. So you can initialize it again. And this one, uh, I'm using, I'm creating a user schema class to identify. Uh, each field using the marshmallow library so again it will give you so uh, i give it new initialization saying like this which gives which which state which i'm telling my rest api uh, if i pass a single field single field for my tables i can do this one when i say many it can transfer all of my this into JSON serialization format. So when I say that here, for example, here you can see this one, I say list users. So when I say, when I write, this is a route. Plus, by using up to route here and giving this can be any route. This is my preference. I just put it like this, that you can change if I want. When I run slash this route from my backend, all the data in my database will be listed. How they are going to be listed is in JSON format. This is what the, farm, uh, the Marshmallow is doing. I call this initialization I did using the Marshmallow, and I told it to list me all the data for my database in JSON format. That's what it's doing. So it's mainly showing how if, I, uh, if I'm asking it all of the, the users in my database, I'm asking a lot of users, right? So this is just will uh, justify or will make 
in JSON format, all of my data. But if I want to make a single field in pages by format, for example, this one, I'm passing, um, passing uh, routes, uh, say user data slash ID. I'm just asking it a single user. So for that purpose, I'm going to use this one. I'm just going to ask for the marshmallow to show me the particular user's ID in JSON format. Just similar thing is just a singular, and this one is a plural. When you have a lot of rows, you can use this one. Using marshmallow again here, the flask will give you this decorator up to crowd where you can identify your crowd name and your method. So this is a get method. I'm getting a data. Uh, this one again also a get, but I'm passing an ID, which means I'm asking for a single user. And this one, it's a, still a single user, but put indicates you are trying to update something. You are to change some information about that particular user. Delete, as the name suggested, after I give the ID, it will delete that particular user. I'm defining here my route and its meters first to it. And here I'm um, post, which means you will be storing a data to your database. So I define my REST APIs like this. I have a put, a delete, and a get, and a post. So after defining each route, this user ID will automatically, after you put it like this above the function, when you call the user ID function, it will automatically dictate that it's a post function. It's a so anyway, if you, when you call this route, the function that will be will be executed is the one below it. The same goes for this one and the same goes as well. So in this function, I'm asking is the will have two input values. The request will grab a name and an email that we will pass from the front end and it will just put it on the user's class that I just created above to create my model. And here I'm just adding the user to my uh, database. So this db2 session will commit it, which means it will be added to my database. The same goes for here, for deleting, I just change the name of delete. So I am commanding my database to delete that particular ID. The same goes for this, so I the same uh, kind of structure is found, but in different uh, keywords. Uh, the other, this db, you, you might be wondering where it comes from. I have to mention here, first I define here my connection. So uh, my database URL is this one, my username is this, my password is this, and first class is the database being uh, created on my Postgres script. So class, this is just, I defined it and I said I'm using the SQL alchemy and I pass all this post information here. Now DB automatically access my database on my local machine. So by calling this one, you can interact with your database. Now this code shows you your backend connection with your database. So before going to your front end and testing this application with your front end, the first thing that you will do is either install this function, this extension name Thunder Client on your Thunder Client here. You can install it. I already installed it. It will give you, uh, if you know, I don't know if you are familiar with Postman. Uh, so there is another option, Postman. Postman and Thunder Client have the same functionality. You can test your REST API routes on them before you integrate it with the front end. That's usually this postman. It has the same functionality, but I'm going to use the extension on this code. So let's see, I already put it just print new, re new request. So your backend starts with this URL, then you can add. I'm just going to show you. So you just put here. So since I already have created here, let's just start from. Listing all users. Okay. Uh, the gate file, this one. This. So this 5000 is the URL of your backend. When you run Flask Run, it will give you the URL to access your backend. So after that, I'm just going to add the list URL. This is the route that I defined on my backend. So I have to call it to access. Okay, where was it? Here. This route, you see? 
that this one is when you add this route, the, fun the which function will be automatically executed will be this one, which is the database to list all your information from your database in JSON format. So you know, if I run this one, I should be able to see every data that is in the database. You can test first. The first thing you have to do when you get done with your Python REST API is test it here. So I just test it there. I now know this particular route is working. It's doing what I ask. We can test all of the routes on our backend. So let's say I want to add a new user. A new user. So on here, on the JSON format, first here, there's a body section. Click the body and it will give you the JSON format. If you take the XML file or text, uh, you can just explore how you can use standard client for, but mostly we use the JSON format. Here in JSON format, you will pass the name and the email, and then just save send. Now it's created a new user on our database. What else is there? Or oh, let's say we want to choose. So this one has a number six, right? D. Now let's just say we, can, we want to edit it. The put is for ADD. So I want to change it to this one. So let's say or something. Okay, let's change it. I'm saying it is for one. If I want to delete this one, again, I can go, I just have here, I forgot to show you, this is where you change which method that you are planning to use. Now we want to delete the last one because we just created. Six, delete, so it's deleted. This is now already created, but it will list everything that's fine in my database. So now we tested the backend. We now we have a working REST APIs for the CRUD application. Maslet is connected with our frontend and see all this interaction on our frontend. Now we're done with our backend. Now let's go to the frontend part, which is this one. So when you create a React application, you have a public folder and it's a REST folder where most of your pages components are found. And you have a package.json, which you can, you can see all the packages that I just installed for this content. I installed Axios, which is a very important library to have to connect with your backend. It will, the Axios will, uh, using Axios, you can call any URL. So I can call HTTP with uh, sorry, I just uh, 127 this URL with Axios and it will automatically detect it on my front end. Uh, what else is there? I also do really also installed React Router DOM, which is uh, another package that will give you the ability to have a routing in your app, which is you can have different components and you can create a routing on them to access those components, which we'll see. What else is there? Also installed the chart.js library that can give you the options to have charts on your application bar chart line chart we have a lot of charting types you can use by installing this application which we will see also uh, so i also this one is not much better but I was, these are anyway these are the dependence that i just installed in my wrap up now let's just go to the application this is so the React application, the view, the Angular, how they work is they use a single component in that, from that single component, you can also access other components. So this, when I run my React application, the first application that will run is this one. This is actually just the first uh, component that will run when I run my React application, any React application. But Based on this one, I can call other components. If you can see here, I'm calling the home, the display, the form, the user component from this up to JSX. 
So somehow you have to the your components are connected to a single component. So technically, a single component is running on your laptop, and that single component can access different components in your application. So this React View Angular are called a single. Uh, they are usually called a single component applications because a single file is running, but the other are connected to it. So that's good. So uh, this React Outer Dome here that I just showed you, this application will give you a routing, uh, a compound routing functionality. So I just call this route, and the only things from this packet that I want is this two. So this two will give you uh, the option to give a routing name for your component. So I have a co home component. I want to access the home component by writing on my on my browser. Uh, this is my browser. My app app is running under the fine fifty one seventy one. Of link. So after this, if I write slash chart, the home component will display in my browser. If I didn't put anything, just slash, it will display the display component. Uh, if I write slash form, it will display the form. And if I do this one, it will display this particular uh, component. This is what the rest of can do for you. So you can just give a lot of parts to different components that you have and make the connection to make the option to run it on your browser okay so okay then let's see our page this each page what they are doing so forget the home component part that is pretty slash for the display part here so uh, the other extension you should uh, install is react station if you take that react for your dashboard, you should install this package. It will give you again uh, shortcuts. So let's say let me create a new component. So this practice to start means the custom data. And try to make your component name as descriptive as possible. So the form will indicate you there is a form tag on my form component. So if you try edit user, it will, it will have some kind of uh, user interface for editing user information. So uh, being descriptive on your naming is also a good practice when you are using React. So since I have the extension, if I write RFTE, both can give you the same uh, output but in different formats. So if I just click here, it will just load for me the React component structure. If you don't have this extension, you have to write it. The like React component structure is like this. There is it's just like this. There's a return component. Your HTML tag will be written under this. You have to write it manually just to avoid that, and you have to export it so that this can be component can be reused anywhere, any place that you want to use it. So you have to manually write the code. But with the extension, you don't have to. You just have to write RFC and automatically this option will come both of them give you the same structure it's just different way of writing it okay. remember the first one it just instead of like this it use the arrow function just that way of writing is different but they have a similar output so this is an extension that you can use as an addition now let's just go to the display part so once you have the structure here, I just added a normal HTML tag that I want. I want to dis I, I decided to display all the users in a table format. So I use the HTML tag table tag. So if you are familiar with HTML, this should be easy to understand. That's what I did here. I use tailwind to be defined the structure of my this component of the table and stuff like that. This is what I did in short. And whereas edit user has the same structure and I used a link. All of them are done with the same structure, but it's different for different purposes with different HTML tags. So this is the form here. And you know, 
let's see how we can integrate the backing with our front end. Uh, this is a component folder. You can create this just to make my structuring of components different. Uh, see, this can be, you can do uh, this one based on your choice. You can have the component not a requirement. Usually, most developers put their component in the same folder, with their page on the same folder. It's just a, a best practice on React. It's not a requirement. And what else? You have to know. Before we move the integration part, the CSS is a where I define my tailwind. The main JSS is where uh, I'm calling this upgrade JSX here. I'm calling it the root application, so I'm just telling you to uh, run my application, my actor JS, every time I, I write in any page on dev on my terminal to run my application. And the other thing on React Dome you have to remember is you have to define it on the.jx so it can be accessed by every component. So because I defined it right here like this and put the app inside the router, every router I put will be understood by each component is as this app component. So you do that. Other than that, I think it's pretty Pretty clear, and you, if you have image and stuff like that you want to access, uh, you put it on the public folder. This is a default folder that comes when you install React, and you can access it from here. Okay, I think we seen everything that is on the React framework, and now let's just see how you can integrate it with the backend, the backend we just created. So. Like I told you, Axios is an important library to make an integration between backend and frontend. So, install this application. I already put also in a comment here the installation command. So, once you install the Axios library, what you have to do is uh, first, let me just tell you about this use state and use effect. These are hooks. React has hooks. Use a fake, use a state. There are a lot of hooks. These are just the most commonly used. But when you are uh, building a more complex React application, uh, it's likely that you can use a lot of hooks with React. So, this hook's purpose is they can give you different functionalities you can use on your component. So, the use state hook of React will give you the options to create. A temporary storage for some data on that particular component. So here I'm creating a users and set users. This is how you write a user state. So I'm just giving it a temporary storage. So if I put store something on the set users, I can access it through the, this user's keyword. So this is for storing whatever data, data you want, and this is will be the data users. So uh, we're going to see it step by step, but the use step purpose is it will give you a temporary storage in that component. Uh, but once you, for example, I'm running the display component. So if I move to the form component, whatever I store here will be restated. So this temporary storage will, worry, will only work once, uh, only when you are on the display component. On the browser, when you run this component, you can access all the data using your storage here. While you are on the display component, that if you but if you go to another routing routes, it will you will lose it will restore itself. So it's a temporary storage. Uh, the user state is a hook that will run when you run your component one time. It will run one time depending on how you give it. So if you give it this uh, array at the end when you use user state, it it means it will run the get user function only once. So when you access the display component, automatically before anything wants, the user state will run. And this array will indicate it will only run once. But if you don't, if you don't put this array, it will every few seconds, every second, this function will be called whenever you are on the display component on your router. So the display component, we can access it by running the slash on right. So the first time when I run any theme run dev, this uh, automatic component that we run is this one, and the user fit will run automatically the get user function, which is this one. 
that uh, swings with the one, it will make the request very uh, to be called over and over again, which will make your application busy. So we don't want that. Calling in the function as is enough. So when I run this one, I get you the function and see it here. So the part value which you already know on the back end, I'm telling the users to get this URL and paste the data. On the update KY, it will return a specify a JSON result to our front page. Then this, so here, then I would catch the response that I get from here. Then the then will will continue to grab the response from the access file that will get a response. If you want to be sure if the response is uh, if the response is rejected from the backend. You can console your login using this one, this was the data or data, which we'll see. You can see on the part of the console file and the state users here, the temporary storage, state users. I called it this function that I just uh, the one that I initialized it, and I passed the response to data, which is the user's data. And I'm, at, I'm telling it here by using the user state hook to store this data on the user's variable. So if you display the user's variable in the console, you, the data you're going to see is this one. This one. Why we are doing it like this is because we want to display the users on our front end here. So I'm I'm calling the users. I'm mapping it. Map is it will look through the users. Since we have a JSON file, it will look through. It will identify the item and the ID. And it will list everything. I will get the user ID, the user name, the user. I'm telling it to display this one. If the user is not empty, it will display all of this thing here. And next to my table, I have an edit and a delete button, which will pass the edit. This is the row that I just defined here, which will get, which will accept an ID here. So every time someone clicked any of the users, uh, by clicking the edit button, the automatically the user ID for that particular group will be passed to this route. Then you can edit or delete that file. So I hope anyway the integration, how you can call your uh, backend using this address to your front end display. This is the same uh, way of integration works on the edit, on the backend, on the form also. Here now, I am also getting here data here. Put you know, I'm um, editing on the edit, I'm editing right. So before I just access to get now, I'm going to use access to put, which will pass the uh, which will update my data over database access in the back end. And the form it's we're going to be used at first because using the form, we're adding a new data to the back end. So the inputs are the values that you're going to grab from your content. So someone can write their name in it. And this particular information that's written on the back end, is, is, there's a hybrid submit function that I assigned here before. The so submit, um, i show you here, we'll grab the inputs. The inputs are, it's just, uh, I'm going to show you the first to go through it. So you can, it will page. When someone write a name, there is a default event that is in the browser. It will detect the name, the value, and pass it to your uh, front end, which which where you can save it on a temporary storage here. So the input will now contain the values of the name, the value, the email on your front end, front end and pass it to the new backend. Yeah. So this value will be passed to your backend. And will be stored on your database. So this is how the connection is made. Now let's just run the application and see everything that I just talked about. And the time so everything is run. Around. So let's just go to the application here. So the display component is the one that is written here. So every time I run it, the user will be fetched. When I say console, let's just inspect it here. You see it right. This means this one. Let's go to the display. 
this console is this data. So use a fit when you run the display, we we'll like I told you, we we'll run once and it will uh, grab the response and display it on console log. The console log output you will see it. Put the just to show you, see output. When you write console log on the front end, the console log you will see it here in this console. So I'll click instead for those of you who cannot see it when you try any instead. This time feature will happen will be viewed on the browser in the console. If you have a console on your front end, it will all consoles will be displayed here. So you see how good it is written in the JSON format. This data is coming from the back end using the REST API. The user effect is run once, and you can see all of the data you have on your database. And what I'm doing here right now is I grab this data and I display it on my front end. You see, by styling it a different way, you can be creative as you want. I decided to display it on a table format. That's what I did. Uh, and to show you the user effect change here, if I remove the array part here, see, it will call your backend, it will request to your backend to, to get the data call every second, which will, when you have a complex uh, project, when you are doing a complex project, having this too much request to your backend is really going to be, it's going to make your application very busy. So it's not a good practice. So just limit how much you want to run your application. I um, mean, you, you want to call your request. So now it will just call it one, one time. Okay. Oops, that's clear. Now let's just add a new user. Now let's see. So when I write this, there's an event triggered by the browser, and that's how I am extracting the values from the browser. So this event will catch the MODI in the MODI and it will store it in the use state using the form component. We'll grab this data using the event of the browser and we'll pass it to the backend to be stored. So if I save, now MODI is added. If I want to do it before deleting, I can edit it again. When I edit it, you can see it right. The ID of Molly is eight. When you edit it, I'm passing, if you remember, user.id is passing uh, the ID of this particular row to the next route. So edit slash eight is passed. So let's edit it. If now I can exchange. If I want to delete it, just delete that, just delete it. See, now you see the full, full stack application. You make a connection between the back end and the front end. You have this small, smooth interaction between each other. You can see the changes immediately on the front end. The back end is reading the front end, the front end is reading the back end. So everything, this is a full stack application. So this is the demo. Now we see we have seen an end to end application. Which includes post back in in front of the application. Uh, it took most of your time, but I hope it's worth it. Worth it. And thank you. Okay, hope that's clear. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask. We are past time. Is it clear at least, maybe, what I presented? Okay, is it confusing for all of you? Only one person reacted. Okay, any question? Okay, I'll walk her. So, um, my question, uh, it's everything is clear. And uh, I, what I wanted to ask was uh, from, uh, it's based on our uh, data set and what uh, if if it's possible can you explain to us uh, which features or uh, what kind of uh, like for example the tables here are for users and everything 
So in terms of our table for our data, uh, can you explain to us how we should go about it? Yeah, I forgot to show you how you can use charges chart to JS library, which can help you with your project because I am sure you want to see some charges on your dashboard. See, these uh, libraries are creating me this file, so I haven't passed all it the relevant data, but which you can do for your particular project. So let's see the how I use this package to display charts in my laptop. Here, I have this bar chart, for example. I'm accessing it from the charters this library, like this one. I just give it a mock data here. Okay. Uh, Pie chart, area chart, you can use that. So I first initialized my bar chart in my bar chart like this. Now, both of these charts require props. It's a data that you have to pass through and the pie chart will be displayed. Again, the bar chart again expects a props to come from some component. So I'm accessing, I'm passing these props from my home component here on my page. I have home component. So I give it. You can see it here. Um, for the pie chart, I'm passing this data. Let's say I have a data of this and this. Two, I have two data. I give it a color. And I, for the bar chart, I'm giving it a mock data. I have these data. There are some data or some column. And let's say you can give it a label, pass the each bar's color, I give it the same color. Now, after I did, I'm passing these props, these data to my chart, to the pie chart. So I'm accessing the pie chart. The pie chart is this one, the component pie chart, which is the one that I just showed you here. So in your case, I'm gonna, in your case, it would be, you are accessing your backend, your REST API or your database, and there's a data that comes from the backend. And in this, um, a passing a mock file, right? But in your case, if you have this data that you pass, you get from your bucket to your front end, you can pass that data here. So, for example, if I have the users, let's consider I, I pass them here. So instead of 100, I use the user.id, users.id. So I don't have any users in this component, but if the users.id is a part of a, a, let's say, some value of some Thing that you want to show in a bar chart, pass it like this. Each of them, you can look through it also if you have more data. You probably will have, so uh, it's just a mock data. Now I just passed it to my bar chart component. This is my probe, and the bar chart, bar chart will take this data and display it on like this on your front end. So if there is two. I hope you get it. Just the pie will display any of the data you pass to it uh, on your front end. So I, for your project, this pie chart library will be very useful. Uh, but I don't know where it is there. Um, okay, uh, so there is the uh, uploading, maybe if you want to upload, uh, you, the React has the HTML tags you can uh, add the functionality to upload a file, which uh, you can explore for maybe you want to give someone uh, the option to upload a CSV file and see that one that changes uh, that file in different charting form. So you can also use that. It depends on how you want to uh, display your data on your front end, but other than that, I think charges will be very relevant to your project. Uh, what can I hope that's clear? Okay, any other question? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I, I didn't actually 
uh, will articulate my question, but it's just a doubt. Uh, so when we receive the data set, for example, it have multiple columns. So uh, can you explain to us like uh, how we should create a table out of the one table, for example, if you look at it like from the CSV file, it's just one big data table. So yeah, is there a better way to chunk it down? I mean, you can drop the column that you don't think is relevant. That's an option. Maybe you can separate the table and store it in different tables and maybe create a relational database between each, like in the natural view. So you you get it right. So you can separate, uh, divide, divide, either you can drop the unnecessary columns or you can divide your table and create a relationship between each table so that it can be. That it can be more easier to access uh, the column but other than that when you if your question is how when you display it on the front end you don't have to call each table to display for example if you see it here when i display the table here you can see it i have only four uh, fields in my users table but i can choose not to display this one i can just remove this one you just can display the relevant columns from your table on your front end you don't have to list everything so if i am mapping through and i just want to display maybe the news id and the design news uh, topic that you just saved on your database you can you can just access the only the data that you want on your front end and again also you can choose which data to store on your database that are going to be displayed on your front end Uh, is that clear a bit, Abaka? Yes, yes. Yeah, you just can be creative as you want. Okay, Jabez, you can go ahead. Okay, so I was working on uh, uh, the previous tasks on uh, uh, Jupyter uh, notebook, but uh, when I saw uh, your uh, course before, uh, Today also uh, on the stream streamlit library and also now uh, mm. on the React, I saw that it's uh, Visual Studio Code is the best way to go. So if uh, I start coding in the Visual Studio Code and if I post it on GitHub, is it okay if I do two uh, two type of uh, you know tools if I use? Is that okay? Yeah. Let me just show you about Visual Studio Code. You can access Jupyter Notebook from your Visual Studio Code. I usually use VS Code for everything. So if you write Jupyter, I don't think I am on the extension file. Let's just do it. Yeah, Jupyter Notebook extension you have it already installed it you can install it and let's say i want to create a notebook here ip this is a notebook extension file now i have a notebook i can access pandas here all the data here i usually use this one you you could do everything through your VS code, or you can use Anaconda in the others way that you are guys doing. It will do the same thing. This is how you access your notebook, right? On Anaconda, this is the same form. You have a sale where you can write. You can add a new sale. Or Google Colab has the same format. Your VS code has a lot of extension in it that is make your life much easier. So sometimes, uh, maybe on the future, uh, some modules especially need a lot of GPUs, which your machine doesn't have. When that happens, you have to use 
with AWS Jupiter's uh, or Google Colab have much better GPU than this to run some models. So other than the for simple data analysis, you can use a base called Jupyter. It will do the same as the one that you're already using. Okay, Jabez, from there. Any other question? Okay, can you give me a final uh, emoji reaction that you understand everything? Or at least to some extent? And you're ready to work on your dashboard. Okay, thank you. All right, so if you need, uh, if, I don't know if I have a question on the chat. If there's any question. If you have any question, again, you can reach out on the Slack. Uh, thank you. I take so much time from you guys, so I apologize for that. Uh, that was sad. I guess we can end the tutorial here. Thank you for joining in. Okay. Happy working.